these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. Okay, don't mind me here, Kyle. Let me just uh, pull up the NBA standings for the 47th time today and take a quick peek here. Just want to make sure. Yep, Timberwolves still in first place in the Western Conference solo at 10-3, and three, a half game in front of the Nuggets and the Thunder. Just wanted to make sure that didn't change in the last two minutes. They told me I was too optimistic, Phil. They told me after the Hawks game that we were homers yeah. and that we need to be more critical. And I think I said it's October. Uh, and all of a sudden we fast forward. It is November 21st, 2023. The Minnesota Timberwolves have lost one game this month. Mm. So uh, a little bit on one today, but I have no other way to word this than to just say suck it, haters. So My favorite team <laughs> is awesome, and your favorite team sucks. Let's get ready to suck it, <laughs> in the words of Triple H. So um, would you, if, would you, if given the opportunity, hang a banner that says something like, First time in first place alone in the Western Conference this late in a season since 2003, 2004. Because I'm ready to, I'm ready to print that thing up. If you are, I, I, I continuously don't understand the miserable bleeps out there that are like just keep telling me that I have to wait till April to like put a smile on my face. Yeah, it's fun right now, right? Like it's if fun I just, right now. if I lived, if I lived, if I was Oscar the Grouch and I lived in a trash can my whole life. And then all of a sudden, I was allowed to stay at a Holiday Inn for a couple of weeks. I would be like, "This is awesome," and that's what I feel like. I feel like Oscar. Don't get Grouch, used to it, Oscar. Okay, yeah. like, that well, what uh, if, continental breakfast might not be there for you tomorrow. Yeah, I hope you like double beds, loser. It's like, yeah, actually, it's great because I used to sleep on needles and old newspapers. So uh, <laughs> let's okay. I will try to bring myself down. Yes, the Minnesota Timberwolves. What are we woke up today? They're ten and three. They have. A uh, weird loss to the Raptors that I thought we did a pretty good job back then being like, eh, a couple shots, maybe I go in. Not a great start to the season, but a, a weird matchup. Um, a pretty despicable Atlanta Hawks game that you were cruising in, that you kind of let your foot off the gas. And then a Suns game where, you know, Chris, Christopher Hine from the Star Tribune was there, uh, did a really good pod with Dane Moore. He basically just said, like, they, they didn't punt on it by any means, but they were just exhausted. Yeah. So all of a sudden it's like, uh, Dane and I talked about this last week about like good wins, good losses, bad wins, and bad losses. The Wolves don't have many like bad wins. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Um, they have a bad loss uh, for sure against the Hawks, but not only are they 10 and 3 in, in first place in the West, but they're beating. I mean, even like you look at the Dallas Mavericks or even the Knicks were kind of coming into Target Center last night on a little bit of a hot streak, but they'd beaten bad teams in the East. The Wolves are beating all the good teams. The Knicks were a good team. And I, I've made this analogy analogy to you before, but I used to tune into Wolves games in the past when I was living in a trash can and dreading it. It's just like, oh my God, now I've had a full day of life and now I have to go watch my team get pummeled by 20. I watched games like last night where I just tune in and at no point last night did I think my team wasn't going to win. They just handled it professionally. Officiating was an absolute joke. Again, both ways, but very tough on the Wolves. Um, physical, I don't know, and just... They just kept their head down and executed, and all of a sudden they're up by 18 in the third, and it was a celebration. You know, it, it's funny because they haven't, even when they've kind of popped up, you know, last couple of years, and they've been competitive and a playing team, maybe get to the to the playoffs. They've never really been a dominant home team. You don't think of Target mm -hmm. Center in the last 20 years, anyways. You don't think of Target Center as being for the team and just the atmosphere, this daunting place to play. Like I remember, you know, when I really fell in love with the NBA, it was probably like. You know, early, mid, late 90s, just yeah. the, the Wolves were garbage. And so I, I did fall in love with the Wolves during the garbage, like Christian Leitner, you know, Isaiah Ryder era. But I, I watched a lot of you know, Bulls basketball. I have family in, in Illinois. And I remember thinking like some of those atmospheres, man, it'd be awesome if Target Center could be like what Sacramento became, where everyone's got a cowbell and they're going crazy. But the but the Target Center with with rolled up program guy, you know, Bill, the lawyer mm -hmm. guy that used to mm -hmm. sit courtside, you know, uh, there was an atmosphere there. I would say late nineties, early two thousands that made it really hard. And the team was really good. It's starting to turn a corner now where these road games, gosh, they're falling behind. They have to dig out against the Pelicans without Zion. There's some, like we could sit here and really critique the way that they've played some of these road games, the sun's game. That's a schedule loss, but the home games, dude, I mean, they're six and zero at home. 
wins over the Nuggets, wins over the Celtics, uh, the Knicks last night. Well, that game wasn't really close at all. And it's it's a small sample size still, but as we get further into the end of November, into December, like when do we start calling Target Center and the Timberwolves just one of the hardest teams to beat in that arena? Right now, the Nuggets are 7-0. and They're undefeated. Um, in the Eastern Conference, Boston 5-0. and Philadelphia is a tough place to play. Milwaukee's a tough place to play. Those are also really good teams, but I'm so I'm super impressed with what they're building at Target Center right now, I guess is my long rambling point. And this is a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast, and a lot of the lifestyle is about just being a fan or, you know, actively rooting for this team to have some sustainable amount of success. But uh you're you were saying that earlier and it, it made me think, do you remember last night, uh Wolves 117, Knicks 100? There was a moment, again, that game was pretty physical, and that's mm-hmm. going to be a trend in terms of X's and O's and real basketball analysis. You're going to start to see teams be really physical with the Timberwolves because it's one of the ways that teams will cling to like, well, you know, in the past when we've been physical with them, they, they've they been immature and they haven't responded. We've seen the Wolves respond in Golden State after that brawl. I thought the Pelicans game was a little frisky, and the Wolves responded. And yeah. then last night against the Knicks, like it was like your little brother trying to be physical with you and the wolves or the big brother and just like, Oh, not enough. Go to bed. Like we're, we're going to win this thing. But last night there was a moment. I don't remember the exact play or how it started, but there was essentially a tug of war for this rebound that Rudy Gobert finally secured. And I think target center gave him a standing ovation for yeah. grabbing a defensive rebound. Not like petty, like, Oh my God, you guys gave up 40 offensive rebounds and now you finally got one. But uh, like yeah. fans acknowledging, and this is why I legitimately think that this is the smartest fan base because if you're still a fan of the team after all these years, again, living in a garbage can, you're like, I've put up with so much bad basketball. I know what good basketball looks like. I just want to see it. And you saw it last night. And it was just, it was kind of funny in the moment to hear people <laughs> commending and standing up like Rudy yes. Gobert just, you know, unblocked everyone on Twitter, but a uh, really just awesome moment. And I, I think that's a big deal. I, I'm always impressed more by road wins because I've been, you know, anyone, you've been in a road arena and it's it's tough, right? You normally don't get calls and when things don't go your way, the fans get really loud. But I'm becoming more and more impressed with what Target Center has become. It is a loud arena with really smart, passionate fans. And last night, Rudy talked about it. I think Nikhil commented on it. Carl commented on it. Like, the players get that too. So we have come a long way, Phil, from about a year ago, right? In November when we were like, should you boo the boo the players? And now it's like, should we pick up Rudy and bring him to the game so he doesn't have to drive? Yeah, like, we've it come is. a long way. It's dude, the the PR rehab I feel like is a whole side street for us here in terms of you know the first guessing of the trade a year and a half ago, and then the doubling down when you saw the team sputtering, and then and then of course, man, at the end of the season when Kyle and Rudy are fisticuffs on the sidelines, and the, and and that's like the first time all year that the national media picked up on let's. Why don't we check in and see how things are going after the Rudy Gobert trade? Bam, pow, right. punches all. Oh, yeah, classic. And I don't know, Rudy goes, you know, gets his body right and gets his mind right with a darkness retreat. He looks like a different player. The team seems to be embracing him in a different way. I think Mike Conley factors in. I mean, and Chris Finch, too, just emphasizing the importance of, hey, he's not going anywhere and he's really good. So it everything feels different surrounding Rudy. And I'm excited, too, because that game against the Sixers, you talk about how teams over the last few years will look at the Wolves and say, yeah, they're kind of soft. If we could just be physical with them, we can throw them off their game physically, mentally. I feel like the Sixers are like the George Washington on the Mount Rushmore of teams that get in the Wolves' heads, right? Where Joel Embiid punking Carl Anthony Towns, Joel Embiid buddying up with Jimmy Butler. You know, the, the Sixers are sort of this... This and the Wolves have gotten a couple over on the Sixers over the last few years too. There's been some some nice games between the two teams where the Wolves have come out on top, but this is a different feel. And the Sixers are coming to town tomorrow night, and it's no longer just like Carl fending for himself against Embiid and the Bullies, right? Gobert is in the house. I don't know if Jade McDaniel's is going to be ready with that ankle to play in that game, and that's going to factor in. Mike Conley, Anthony Edwards is different than he was a couple of years ago. So to see how this team matches up specifically with the bully that is the 76ers is going to be really fascinating. But how many times with the Sixers originally coming to town? Like, I think when they got James Harden a couple years ago, their first game was against the Wolves, and 
it might have been on national TV, but James Harden and Embiid just cooked the Wolves. But how many times have this is the Knicks, this is the Celtics, this is the Nuggets have good teams come to town, and while you're excited to go watch them, you had very little, myself included, confidence in them to actually live up to the moment, right? Or, or like respond. the wolves, the wolves to beat that. And I don't know. Yeah. I haven't checked like what the line is on the gambling purposes for tomorrow. I'm just going to tell you, this isn't like a jinx. I am very confident they're going to beat them. I don't know. I still think the Celtics are awesome. Been watching a lot of their games. They dropped one to the Hornets last night. I still think the Nuggets at full health are awesome. Those two teams I would still put in another tier above Minnesota. But outside of that, Philly included, I don't think there's a team, Phil, that's like right now, late November, that's playing as well as Minnesota. They even have some injuries, right? They lost McLaughlin. They might lose Jaden for a week or so. Uh but they just their depth, their ability to execute, and then the thing that you and I have harped on the most, and, and a lot of people have, is the maturity. It's as much as I love watching a Timberwolves game now, I almost love listening. Well, I love waiting for after the win to see what Timberwolves Brazil posts because it's always <laughs> it's just weird, absolute weird. <laughs> levels of drugs yeah. that I've never gotten to yet. But uh, it's <laughs> also just the quotes after the games is just. Nikhil talked last night about how tight this group is off the court. Carl, go look at Dane Moore's Twitter page. Like Carl gave some really cool quotes about just realizing now like what it takes to win. And I know that they still haven't won anything of importance. Yeah. But I, I just always try to go back to my personal mantra of be where your feet are. Like living in the moment right now, I don't know what's going to happen in January, February, maybe April, hell, maybe May. But you're just living in the moment June. of watching a team. June. June. Yeah, maybe June. June. Maybe June. Um, you're watching a team grow up in front of your eyes. And I know that we've all seen Lucy pull the football from Charlie Brown too many times. And you you might have trust issues. But I don't want to lose out on what could be my one true love because I've been burned too many other times. This team is uh, about as lovable as it gets. And every night now they come out and, and do something that kind of makes you proud to be cheering for them. So you uh, you just segued brilliantly there, whether you tried to oh, or not, no. into what we're going to talk about next. <laughs> Who year. knows? But I do, I do want to mention too that the uh, the Sixers are coming off a back to back tomorrow night, so they play on TNT tonight against the Cavs. So I haven't okay. seen an updated line until after they play the Cavs. But uh, yeah, so another schedule advantage. The Wolves have had some schedule advantages in the first few weeks, so this will be another one where the Sixers are coming off a back to back. But it's the I think we can say it's the best Timberwolves team in 20 years, you know, if health sustains itself. It feels like the franchise, to your point, you say they're sort of coming of age or growing up in front of our eyes. It feels like the franchise is sustainably turning a corner here these last three years or a couple of years ago. Finch first full year. They have a winning record. Then they make the Gobert trade. OK, back to back playoffs. First time in two decades. Now they're headed there again. Right. It feels like they're cleansing the past mm. these last two or three I know years. Where you're going. Right? And and you did, you, we, we were texting about this and you came up with a fun idea of sort of like a kind of like a half baked, how would we pull this off on the show? Like, what if we held like a burning ceremony to officially cleanse ourselves of Timberwolves past failures? And I was like, yeah, well, how could we structure this on the show? So I literally Googled burning ritual for cleansing past. And I found a website, and I just want to read you. I think we've got some structure for this exercise, okay? Letting Go Gives Us Freedom is the title of this article. For centuries, indigenous groups used smoke as a symbol of their thoughts and prayers rising to the great spirit. Engaged couples have also released the past in a burning bowl before taking their vows and moving forward as a couple together. Whatever the circumstances, the purpose of the ceremony is to shift consciousness. It's about becoming still, naming what you want to release, and letting it go. And the steps are four. There are four steps here, Kyle, okay? Number one, make a list of what you no longer want to hang on to in your past as a Wolves fan. Number two, light a fire and visualize the smoke taking your thoughts and the past away. Number three, offer an affirmation of release. For instance, quote, today I release what I don't want. With this action, I am healed and renewed. I open my heart to love. I am blessed with peace, joy, and harmony with my favorite basketball team. <laughs> and four, make a list of your intentions for tomorrow. 
I think we should go through these steps. I think I we should it. take your idea. We should manifest it and go through these steps here as we turn a corner with this Wolves franchise. First place as we record this episode. So number one would be make a list of what we no longer want to hang on to as fans of this basketball team going back however far your fandom goes back. For me, it's early 1990s. For you, it's probably mid-1990s. What does that list look like? I love this podcast so much. If you want to uh, listen to high pick and roll coverage and, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, all these other basketball analysis, go listen to Dane. He had Britt Robson on today. Britt's a uh, the great goat. Stuff. We are going to have... Uh, don't basically lie to a... Britt's face, by the way. Yeah, Do not lie to Britt's face. Don't lie to Britt's face in the locker room. Uh, we're going to have a seance, basically, here at Flagrant House. So I came up with a list of random things. Do you just want me to start throwing them out at you? I came, yeah, I no, came I at think, this... I think, yeah, I think we just... Let's just verbalize. Verbalize the list for this podcast. So there was a really good shout out to Timberwolves Reddit, by the way, because they're just there's a lot of cool stuff on there. I get a lot of good details and news from there. But basically, someone ranked like the 10 most embarrassing moments in Timberwolves history. Uh, that list, buddy, is uh, is a long one. But kind of starting with, again, I was born in 88. So about late mid 90s is when I started to kind of like remember being a Timberwolves fan. But uh, 1998. Kevin McHale and Glenn Taylor's illegal contract with Joe Smith yeah, that uh, ended up being, at the time, David Stern, who cared about the league, unlike the current commissioner who cares about underwear, uh, punished the Wolves about as harshly as you could uh, and stripped them of multiple draft picks. Also, the Wolves doing an under-the-table deal with a guy who's <laughs> not really a, a needle mover. Dude, right? like, couldn't have been the- like, wait, Steph, Steph Marbury was the one that wanted the money. Like, you couldn't have thought of that. If you're going to take a shot on that, how about keep Marbury and KG together outside the salary cap structure? Yeah, give, you know? <laughs> like if Mark Laurie and Glenn Taylor would have done a deal with like Cole Aldrich, right, to under the table, it's like, what are we doing? Like, <laughs> wow, Joe disrespect. Smith was good, but Joe, Joe Smith wasn't. He's wasn't. a level up from Cole Aldrich. He's, he's probably a couple number levels one down, pick. though, from, uh, yeah, that's true, but he's a couple levels down from losing multiple first round picks. So uh, <laughs> that was a good one. I'll just kind of rip through these. There was a 1996, the Timberwolves traded the rights uh, to Ray Allen for Stefan Marbury. Worst um, trade in franchise history, by the way. Yeah. Uh, that's, I, think, I think. I would agree. I, I wasn't as familiar with that because, again, 96. But just to think that Kevin Garnett's kind of highlight of his career came playing alongside Ray Allen, just not in the jersey you thought it would be. He would have um, said Paul Pierce because don't they hate Ray Allen? But yeah. Ray Allen was the um, major key to those championships. 2002, letting Chauncey Billups leave in free agency. Wow. 2005, Kevin McHale trades Sam Cassell in a conditional first-round pick for Marco Yarich. When I first heard that trade go down, I was like, wait a second. Wait, so aging Sam Cassell, the Wolves traded Sam Cassell, got a pretty good point guard and a first-round pick? Wait, no? Oh, they traded a first-round pick along with <laughs> Sam Cassell for Marco Yarich. Oh, I see what's happening here. Okay, Yeah, that would have been a good one to mm. analyze on, like, in NBA Twitter 2023, it's like, oh, wow, the Wolves are getting, like, maybe a younger point guard with some upside and, and a pick, and it's like, and then Woj, like, has to quote tweet himself. It's like, actually, I'm oh, hearing sorry. that the pick is going that way, <laughs> not this way. Um, 2006, now, this one I don't remember, but I'm throwing this in the fire. Glenn Taylor unwillingly to pay both financially and in assets for Allen Iverson when he wanted yep. to come to Minnesota. So, I don't know, is, are you, you're getting this from uh, This is from Reddit. Reddit. But that's so like there my was, new Wikipedia, so I believe it. But there was major steam at the time, because uh, this was like the last ditch effort. They had gotten rid mm-hmm. of Cassell and Sprewell. I think they had brought in Ricky Davis or something, or maybe this was right before they traded for Ricky Davis. But it was kind of back to being caging in a bunch of randos. But this okay. time around, they weren't winning. They 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 finished like below five hundred two years. In one of those years, there was a lot of steam about pairing uh, Iverson with Kevin Garnett. And it just, the Wolves either didn't have the assets. I don't think they didn't have assets at the time. Like, what were they going to trade? They wound up getting Ricky Davis. Like, they didn't right. have. So, uh, Iverson, if I remember the timeline correctly, wound up being paired with Chris Weber in Detroit, was it? Didn't oh, Iverson go may- to Detroit? Maybe. Or was it, the, did he go to the Nuggets? Well, he, went, he went to the Nuggets and played with Carmelo. I just, okay. I don't, I don't really remember that specific thing. But that was something that was like, oh, the Wolves had a chance to pair Kevin Garnett with another all-star player and didn't happen. That was 20, 2006. Um, 2009, obviously, David Kahn era, uh, selecting Johnny Flynn over Steph Curry, DeMar DeRozan, just a slew of other guys. Uh, he did get Ricky Rubio, which kind of moved the needle a half inch, but uh, 
nothing else. Uh, 2012, David Kahn and Glenn Taylor decide not to designate Kevin Love as their five-year max contract player. I remember that. Yeah. That we was kinda, uh, an that's interesting... That's a funny one, man, because that was when you had to make a decision, right? You get one five-year max for your own roster. And mm-hmm, they decided, mm-hmm. they said, hey, Kevin, we like you, we don't love you. We're going to give you a four-year max because we think Rubio eventually is going to be worth the five-year max. And they want that wound up being wrong, too. So they kind of... But in retrospect, like, this probably turns into a cat conversation. Actually, Judd and I had this conversation uh, yesterday in regards to cat in that it's really hard once you've designated somebody as, like, the leader of your franchise. This is the best player contractually, statistically, everything. Drafted, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that player's not really good enough to be the leader of a team that aspires to go deep in the playoffs. Usually that player has to be traded. Yeah. And that's what happened with Kevin Love. He gets traded. Okay, now I'm going to a new spot. Oh, LeBron's there. Kyrie's there. Oh, I'm for sure. Like, I can easily play third guy on this new team, but my ego won't let me play third guy on my original team. And the Wolves are kind of side street here real quick. The Wolves are kind of going through that with Carl Anthony Towns, right? For years and years, number one overall pick. Max contract, super max contract. You're the savior of the franchise. And it's become obvious that he's a really good player, but like probably needs to be kind of second or third in terms Mm -hmm. of like a leadership pecking order, franchise, everything. And dude, I think they've pulled off what they, what the wolves couldn't pull off with Kevin Love. Like it would have been nice to have Kevin Love around. If you could find your Anthony Edwards, find Mm -hmm. your Rudy Gobert, right. But they just like weren't in a position. They didn't have good enough players. So they, they traded Kevin Love with cat. It's like, they've kind of had, the awkward, like, we're going to bring Gobert and we're going to move you off the five. It's going to be weird for a year. And now you look around, Carl's having a blast. The last six or seven games, he's averaging 27 points a game as, like, a secondary guy offensively. Defensively, everyone looks at Rudy. Leadership-wise, everyone looks at Conley and Kyle Anderson. Like, they've kind of moved Cat down the pecking order into a perfect situation. That's That's what the Kevin Love thing kind of reminds me of. They botched it with love. They pissed him off. They traded him for, at the time, it was Wiggins, and then he winds up being, you know, what he was. But And well, let's put a pin in that quick. I would like to talk about that a little more. And it's why when things were dark after that Halloween night when uh, they lost to the, to the Hawks in Atlanta, um, it is why – I don't know how else to say this, Phil. I'm trying to be really humble during the holidays and thankful and stuff. It's why I was right and everyone else was wrong. Because I have always said that while Carl has deficiencies and some of the energy vampire stuff is really grinds your gears, he's never demanded a trade. And he's never been a malcontent behind the scenes. And you want him to continue to do what he's doing now because the other stuff is detrimental to the team, as is a trade demand. Mm-hmm. But that is the one thing. I, you worded that way better than I could, so I'll just move on. But they have done what you said. They have thread the needle of changing... I don't know. I don't know where else to plug this in on the show, but I'm just encapsulated by the whole drama of what's going on with OpenAI. I don't know if you follow any of that stuff, but uh, yeah. the one of the original founders, Greg Brockman, kid I went to school with in Grand Forks, North Dakota. He's from Thompson, North Dakota. Shout out the uh, the beautiful city of Thompson. But uh, he was basically demoted down, and they're like, "Oh no, still stay in place. You're just not going to be in charge." Like that's what they've done with Carl, and it's worked, and it's really hard. And you're right. Normally, you have to kind of get rid of that person, but they knew that in order to be as high of a ceiling as they could get, they needed to have not only their new CEO, whether that be Anthony Edwards, but they also needed to have a lot of talent around him in that board of directors, and, yeah. and they've navigated that wonderfully. So that was a great fit yeah, in. Like the fit, Kevin Love thing out. just reminded me of, oh, man, it, ideally you wouldn't, you wouldn't move Kevin Love, but I guess like if, you, if your franchise isn't set up, you need, you need to leverage him for something else. And then they, they thought that Andrew Wiggins was going to be the guy, and that's another thing that I would put in this burning pile, which is like oh, we'll get the there. idea of like Andrew Wiggins being the franchise guy and then just not. <laughs> so then well. if we move on from t- 2012, they decide not we, to make Kevin Are we Love going up. timeline here? Kind of. Yeah. Although you kind of skipped, a, a, skipped a pretty big one. I'm going to get back there. I'm gonna okay. Get, but 2014 flips uh, the late great Flip Saunders, trades the future first for Adrian Payne, who also the late great Adrian Payne. That one – um. Maybe not on the top 10 of misses, but it was not great. Um, tw- 2017, there was the whole Tibbs and Glenn Taylor, uh, including Zach Levine in a trade for Jimmy Butler, which at the time seemed like maybe the high watermark since the Kevin Garnett trade, right? You're finally bringing in 
a superstar player. Uh, we kind of know how all that went. On this Reddit timeline, that's the last thing. The other things that I just had randomly off the top of the dome was uh, Chris Paul, the Jersey, Tuckgate, uh, and OKC that one night That's when they lose right. a game. Yeah. Uh, one time, the Timberwolves voluntarily opened their season by starting Trevi and Graham in their starting lineup. Um, there was the infamous Cream team. I'm just going to leave that one there. Uh, the Wolves once rented out a helicopter to fly D'Angelo Russell around uh, to recruit him. And then when the helicopter landed, he signed with Golden State. That's right. Uh, one time, they <laughs> said that Josh Akogi on the injury report was just cramping. Uh, and then I think he was out for three months with a torn hamstring. Uh, they once referred to Darko uh, as Mana from Heaven. Uh, David Kahn he yeah. seemed more like in Mana an interview from hell. Where, where Chris Weber was. Uh, that was NBA TV yep. Summer League, I think. Yep. And Chris Weber was like, "What?" But then he, he compared <laughs> Darko. He's like, "You know, Darko's got a skill set very similar to yours, Chris, Chris Weber." And Weber's like, <laughs> "Don't ever put his name in the same sentence as my name ever again." And David Kahn's like, "No, oh, I just mean." Chris is like, "No." Seriously. <laughs> yeah, that'd be like if they compared my reporting skills to like someone like Cronkite. It's like, no, actually, I'm just a weirdo Calm who down. sends yeah. tweets. Uh, yeah, so then obviously Wes Johnson over Paul George or any any draft basically mistake from— We're going to need another burning bin here. Second yeah, burning just, bin. Can we, yeah, just light the house on fire, basically. Uh, any draft pick prior to Carl's arrival? I think they basically messed up every draft pick prior to his arrival, and since then it's obviously gotten better. Um but yeah, that was just a lot. That was 21 things that I can come up with, and I'm probably missing 62 more. So here's a, another partial list from our usual producer, Ross Brendel, who's uh, taking mm. some time out this week. And he doesn't even include, I, th- I think there needs to be like a separate bin altogether for the 2009 <laughs> draft where the Wolves took two point guards not named Steph Curry, including Johnny Flynn. Like that's a that's just been this, especially as, as Steph Curry has led this dynasty on the West Coast, right? It's... Now, would that have happened in Minnesota? I don't know. I think they probably had better infrastructure and leadership and ownership there that allowed that to blossom, but that's got to be there. So here's the list from Ross. Marco Yarich's backwards jersey. Oh, yep, yep. Sam Cassell's big balls dance that may have cost the Wolves a championship in 2004 because he basically couldn't play. He injured himself. Kurt Rambis' entire tenure as head coach. Uh, Some of these we've listed. Anything David Kahn ever touched or breathed on. Glenn Taylor's courtside seats with his goofy little sweaters. <laughs> he, <laughs> there. He, there was a moment last night in the game where there was a questionable call, and it was like one player in the camera, Finchy, and then Glenn Taylor behind him. And Glenn Taylor, rest his soul, he, uh, he just looked pretty confused. He looked like someone had just glued themselves to the court again. He was like, what's... What's going on? It's like, I don't know, man. Just look yes. in your bank account. There's $1.5 billion in there. Go uh, <laughs> go sail off into the sunset. And then uh, Ross also includes whatever scouting report had Shabazz being drafted over Giannis in whatever year that was, 2014. Yeah, that was when um, – that was an interesting draft too because uh, – now I'm on the spot. But there was the, the point guard from, um, from Michigan. Michigan had made a run. I think they made the Final Four or the championship. I can't remember what his name was. Uh and they basically traded back, right, to get two firsts, kind of a, a Vikings quasi move to like instead of one first in the mid, we'll we'll move back for two firsts, and then they just still didn't get Giannis, right? They got uh, Shabazz yeah. Muhammad and Gorgie Jang, who Gorgie Jang, as we've talked about on our top 100 list, actually was a pretty good player, uh, and will go down in the archives of history as a, a good Timberwolf. But Shabazz Muhammad was uh, the opposite of that. Yep. So okay, so we that's our list. We put that list of things. It's of like Wolves Burning Man out here. There's angst. a huge fire yeah. going on. Yeah, this is this is actually you know I didn't didn't realize we were going to put that many logs on the fire. So we may <laughs> we may have to call the fire department. This is getting a little out of hand. So we have we have lit the figurative fire here. I don't want to set the smoke alarms off in uh, in my place. And so the affirmation of release, Kyle. Today we release the things in Timberwolves history that we don't want, and with this action. We are healed and renewed. We open our hearts to love, and we are blessed with Timberwolves' peace, joy, and harmony. It's it's therapeutic for me. I was I I came up with this idea a couple of weeks ago. I was like, should we wait till like New Year's? But then I've gone over how much I despise just the concept of New Year's and how it's maybe the worst holiday on the on the calendar. Uh, so what better time than 
Thanksgiving week when we're all trying to be thankful and kind of just reflect and, and look forward. Uh, real, real talk, like Timberwolves fans outside of a year or two um, have basically cheered for the worst professional sports franchise that still exists. Uh, and people that still work there are great. You know, Jeff Munich's employee number one, and he's, he's a legend. Um, but fans have just not got to experience a lot of this, and that's why they're still critical or cynical about a couple weeks of success because they just know that it usually somehow, some way, the Wolves will find a way to to kind of pull the football back and have them, yeah. you know, land on their rear ends. But uh, I'm not. I don't really believe. I mean, I'm wearing a Philadelphia sweatshirt today, for God's sakes. I uh, I don't really believe in jinxes. I, I really think it's time to let some of that stuff go uh, and not watch these games through the prism of, what you remember Alexi Shved doing or what you remember Marco Yark doing. Like this team is different. I've said that they're about as lovable as a professional team can get a lot of good guys playing really mature basketball. Uh, and I think as an affirmation, I am just going to move forward with my favorite team and my, the best team in the West and uh, really enjoy what they're doing because they're not just like, again, they don't have any bad wins, right? Like they're not just eking out games or doing this. Like they're having comebacks on the road on the last game of a road trip. They're, beating the best teams in the league at home and doing it with a style of play that is sustainable. Defense is something you can bring with you on the road. Um, and it's just been, it's been, everyone deserves this is my real take. Everyone that stuck around long enough deserves to be happy. And I am happy as you can tell. So light that mother up. Well, in order to, to finish this process here, according to this random to do a blood uh, Google search here, no, no blood pact. We just have to, to make a short list of our Timberwolves intentions for tomorrow so we can be forward looking. <laughs> okay. okay. And I will I will go for us here. I think okay. obviously a championship at some point would be amazing. So we can we can put that out like toward the bottom here. But I think immediate intentions. I think the Timberwolves winning fifty games for the first time in twenty years. Mm -hmm. The Timberwolves winning a playoff series for the first time in twenty years. And Anthony Edwards being crowned as an all NBA superstar for the first time in his young career. Those are, those are three immediate intentions that I will state on behalf of this show for this Timberwolves franchise. And the 50 wins one, I know we tried to pull off 50 as nifty last year. We didn't sell a lot of those shirts. I don't think we no. sold any of them. Um, it would have been a historical thing to look back at, but I, I do think if you get 50 wins in the West this year, you're going to finish with a top four record. But my only caveat to your intention would be, I just want them to finish with the top four record in the West. We've gone over now. They're undefeated at home. Target Center is a circus in the best way possible. Um, so whether it be 50 wins or 49 wins or 48 wins, their number one goal outside of just trying to maintain health, knock on wood, would be to continue this momentum, to not let down when the schedule gets easier. And it will. November's been a bloodbath, but it will get easier. But to continue to bring this maturity this lunch pail mentality every night so that when the real games kick off in april and may and again maybe june um you're playing in a spot that the fans have made it very difficult for the opposing team um but yeah i'm with you on all nba ant top five mvp candidate ant um a revived Conley towns defensive player of the year uh right now i don't know if you check any of the gambling stuff ever but right now mm -hmm. rudy is First, like the best odds to win Defensive Player of the Year. Check this this morning, and I wanted to drop this in because Alan Horton had an awesome tweet. Uh, after last night's win, Chris Finch has become the winningest coach in Timberwolves franchise history based on all-time win percentage. Win percentage. So last night he passed the late great Flip Saunders. Wow. Um, he was twenty-two to one. Finchy was in October to win Coach of the Year. He is now first best odds at like plus six fifty. Um, yeah. So all of a sudden, now you have all these different guys. The Wolves might have their first set of two All-Stars. I think they've only had that three or four times in franchise history. I mean, everything is trending in the right direction. And it's not just they eked out a win here, they eked out a win there. It's like, hey, they might have their best coach they've ever had. And they might have their best second best player they've ever had. And they might have the deepest team they've ever had. So it's not the fake stuff in the past that you would have eventually had to throw back in the burn pile. It's things that we've never seen before that are growing from the ashes like a phoenix uh so yeah i'm with you on the other attentions though let's 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 try to put some of these out there and yeah. uh wake up wednesday morning and, and kick that off i also should have said uh we intend to drink modest beer 
whenever we well, uh, okay. whenever we can. So you got got home games here. In fact, if you're going to head out, maybe you're going to have some fun on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and you're going to go to the Wolves game pregame and postgame just a few steps down the street at Modest Brewing, Kyle, in the North Loop, really close to Target Center. Uh, Tap Room in the North Loop is one of the best you're going to find. They also have cans available all throughout liquor stores. I think, like, at the liquor store that I usually go to, there's, like, eight different uh, types of Modest cans you can find. So, yeah, looking forward to your next trip to the Twin Cities so we can take you to Modest for a pre- and a post-game action down the street from Target Center, my friend. I uh, I can't start my holiday weekend without and i do have a question for you that will kind of tie into the festivities but uh i know you've i really like listening to flagrant Hiles when it's you and judd and declan in there too just giving a different perspective the more opinions we have the better uh, it helps me but i need you to give me whether it be 30 seconds or 62 minutes on your current stance on carl anthony towns and yeah. whether or not we kind of hinted at this earlier but whether or not you think this might be the perfect scenario for a player like him. Well, the elephant in the room has always been sort of how do you how do you build your franchise around like not around a guy, but like literally like maneuver it around a guy mm -hmm. that's really talented, brings a lot of positive qualities as a player, but I don't think mentally or as a player is the number one guy on a team that wants to win a championship. Like, unless somebody still wants to fight me on that, do you envision Carl Anthony Towns as the number one leader as a player and as a behind-the-scenes guy on a team that wins the championship? I, I have decided as of, like, three or four years ago, the answer is no. It doesn't mean he's garbage. It doesn't mean he's worthless. It doesn't mean that you should trade him for 25 cents on the dollar. Um, I have lit him up critically a lot over the past two or three years. And I stand by everything I've criticized him for with the vampire energy sucking stuff with just sort of, you know, disappearing or shipwrecking almost half the playoff games he's played in. Like I stand by all that criticism, but I've also said on this podcast and before we started this podcast, if there is a way for you to just like snap your finger whatever franchise you are and add a Carl Anthony Towns as like the second or third guy. He's your Chris Bosh with the Miami heat. He's your Kevin love with the Cleveland Cavaliers and it could, and it could happen and you could keep the chemistry and everything. I think, I think people would take that a, a Lamar Odom with the Kobe Bryant and Pau Gasol Lakers from like 10 or 12 years ago, right? Like really talented player, probably not the leader of a championship team, but boy, what a great piece. And when he's kind of off, there's other players that can kind of, make up for him, right? And so, you know, the first handful of games this season, especially that Boston game where, man, like everyone else on the Wolves was ready to just beat Boston at home and have a christening at Target Center, except for one guy, and it was Carl. He had 13 turnovers and fouls in that game. Seven points, I think. He he was the only thing preventing that game from being a just an embarrassing blowout. Since that game, he's averaging 27 points, on 60%-ish from the field. He's knocked down almost 50% of his threes. And most importantly, he's done it all with a calm, focused demeanor. Now, last night, there was a little, like, he fouled out again, and he's doing, like, the, the mocking laughs at officials. But it was, kind of like, the game was already kind of decided. So I guess my take is, I think he's in the perfect situation for him right now. Like, if he were to go somewhere else and be expected to lead that franchise to glory, I, I would worry that it's not going to work out for him but he can kind of blend in here and thrive in his own way. I don't know how they work it financially. If this thing works and they're the one seed and like now they've got second luxury tax apron problems, that is a champagne problem we have not really talked about. Mm -hmm. But I just think this might wind up being a great situation for him if it can sustain the way that it has the last six or seven games. That's my take on it. And I agree wholeheartedly. I think just as a devil's advocate, I would push back. This isn't you, but just in general that there, there's not a couple, there's not many people on earth that are bigger fans of Anthony Edwards than myself and you and probably everyone else listening to this. Um, but some of the stuff that goes into all of this success, I, it's not just all Ant, and I'm not trying to take any credit away from him, but like, I think, again, I'm so pro Finch at this standpoint, but I think not 
firing your coach every time he has a bad game helps, right? Like I think Mm -hmm. having some consistency and some continuity for Carl, uh, whether it be with the front office, I know Tim Connolly just got here 18 months ago, but there's a lot of people in that front office that have been here for a while. Um, ownership, just pu- putting more people around Carl, whether it be even like an A-Rod. Like I know those guys talk and A-Rod tries to consult the players and that makes some people cringe, but it's also, who you know, if I'm an NBA player, am I going to listen to Alex Rodriguez or Steve Ballmer? It's like, I get you're rich, Steve, but like, you don't know what a fadeaway jumper is. You don't know what a big moment is. You don't know what it's like to have to yeah. be down 3-2 in the ninth. Uh, so I think just the Wolves have done a good job of putting people around Carl to give him some continuity and to make that transition that we talked about at the top where it's not easy to be, you know, the worst thing I think you can do in pro sports is anoint someone as the franchise player and that player, like you said, isn't a 1A. It's kind of mm-hmm. like I always think the Hornets are going through with LaMelo Ball. I don't know if LaMelo Ball is a 1A, but I think he's good. But if yeah. he's the face of your franchise, every other person in the pecking order, and you and I are big pecking order guys, uh, it, it just messes all the, the that- chemistry and tenure mm-hmm. up. The Wizards and Jordan Poole right now. Just <laughs> yeah. what a train wreck not, that is. Uh, not, not good. So, no, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to have you. Again, I like to just rib anyone because I'm petty as hell, but uh, you have been right. And, again, we even Dane and I did this a couple weeks ago where it's just like, hey, why is Carl doing this when the thing is good? And since then, Carl has been maybe the team's best player or 1B, but it's also come in moments that I think we have to continue to mention. It's like it wasn't just Carl, you know, being really efficient and having nine assists uh, against the Wizards, right? The Golden State game was super physical, and a brawl started, and he might have been the coolest cucumber on the court. The Pelicans game, you know, I didn't love Carl falling out last night against the Knicks, but against the Pelicans, Ant fouls out, and they're left with just Carl out there and a a bunch of guys kind of looking for him to get it going, and he hits one big shot after another, the big three at the top, and then that kind of leaner going left, controls his body, doesn't get a charge, uh, and then doesn't really do maybe a little if you do something cool. I, I want you to celebrate, but it wasn't like over the top. It wasn't over dramatic. Uh, even last night, there was a sweet video. I think it's from the barber, the team barber. But mm. uh, he was sitting courtside, and Carl hits a three, and like it's the coolest video. I tweeted out, uh, and he was just cool. I mean, he had a little little smile on his face, but he's just he's approaching the game like a twenty eight year old. That's how old he is now. He's not a rookie. He's not young by NBA standards, and. Uh, that is helping elevate because we have said time and time again that for this thing to have its highest trajectory, it has to be Carl and Ant or Ant and Carl. It can't just be one or the other. And so far, so good. The formula is uh, is pretty pretty valuable. Yep. And then we wait and see what happens tomorrow night. We're not going to do our usual Thursday episode because we're going to be uh, eating a bunch of food and then taking naps and watching football mm-hmm. and basketball throughout mm-hmm. the last few days of this week. But uh, if you guys could, please click the like button and the subscribe button on the Score North YouTube channel and a five-star rating and a positive review of Flagrant Howls on Apple Podcasts and Spotify also helps spread the word. I believe the uh, the two largest Timberwolves podcasts in America include Kyle Tige, Dane Moore's <laughs> NBA podcast, and wow. Flagrant Howls. So you uh, are yeah. the straw that stirs the Timberwolves drink. I am, I might, yeah, I'm something. Uh, I don't know if it's good, but uh, I will say too, again, this is the last pod for the week for me on anything. Uh, but I said this on Dane's pod, but the holidays are a really good time for people to reflect uh, and get to get together with family and stuff. But I also know I uh, had some stuff going on last week that the holidays are not always a great time for other people. So if you're listening to this, my message has always been uh, whatever you're going through, you're not alone. Um, you know, reach out to people, check in on people if you haven't heard from a family member or a friend or a loved one. Um, but you, the listener, whoever you may be, wherever you may be listening, are important, you are loved, uh, and and take care of yourselves these next couple weeks because the holidays are fun, I love them, but they can also be a challenge, so. Yeah, amen. And uh, as someone who has a dwindling family because of cancer, we're going to Vegas later this week. That's right, baby, get after it. Start a new tradition, let's go. So appreciate you guys. Flagrant Howls, your favorite Timberwolves lifestyle podcast.